Uh, I've changed my presentation just a bit to reflect last night's uh, events in Paris. Last year on this very stage, at this very time, I gave a presentation about how to defeat ISIS. I actually should be giving that presentation now, I think. But instead, what I wanted to do, because this is the youth segment, I wanted to talk about future threats. And unfortunately, the threats that we are going to leave as an inheritance to our children that they're going to have to solve. So today, I'm going to talk about population and water. And I will try and tie in maybe ISIS at the very end. With me so far? OK, we're good. I think we're going to hear some music. The streets are getting rowdy, and the sky is getting cloudy. And everywhere you go, the people grow. All oh, the rich keep on assuming, and the poor just keep on blooming. Tempers are fuming, and the people grow. Multimedia, it's wonderful. I'm an army guy, I've never used music before. <laughs> um, seven billion people in the world, plus 7.2 billion. Young man, can you tell me how many people there are going to be in 2050? Um, more than 13 billion. More than 13 billion, that's 2075, but very good. Nine billion people in 2050. So by 2075, very good, by 2075, the world will double. We will require twice the amount of food that we produce today to keep the world fed. Right? Unfortunately, the growth in world population is in areas of the world that can least afford population growth. And I like this little uh, indicator here. I like beer. I've never had blue beer before, but uh, I've had the other colors of beer. In, in Boston, on St. Patrick's Day, you can get green beer, you know. But I think you look at North America, and our population growth is small. And particularly in North America, our population growth is mainly due to immigration. But if you look at Asia, Africa, parts of the world that can least afford population growth, that's where the population growth is. And what does this mean? Well, another schematic there. I spent about a third of my life in Asia. I can guarantee that there are a lot of people there. World population, 60% is under the age of 29. In some parts of the world, West Africa, for example, where I also spend quite a bit of time, the age, 60% of the population is under the age of 24. All right? Without jobs, people living on a dollar a day, $2 a day, and you can just imagine that that is a source of potential conflict. People can't earn a living, can't get status, particularly in cultures that require status. It's a recipe for disaster. If you look at the world population growth pattern, you'll notice that the population growth, as I've described before, is in the developing regions of the world, which can least afford population growth. In the developed industrialized regions of the world, population growth is almost static. Now, you can understand why in youth bulge population growth areas that can't afford it, why there would be a source of conflict. But we don't think of the industrialized world and the lack of population could also be a source of conflict. And I'll try and convince you of that now. Europe and Central Asia. 35 is the median age by region. North America, I think it's 39. In some areas of the world, there's actually a youth shortage. A youth shortage. What does this mean? I am now on Social Security. I know I don't look that old. <laughs> You're not buying that, are you? <laughs> I don't look that old, but I am. When Social Security started in the United States, there were 17 people paying into the fund for every person that got a check. Now there are five of you, thank you very much, paying into the fund for which I get a check. In 2020, there will be three. 
young man, when you're old enough to get Social Security, I'm not sure it's going to be there for you, buddy. But, I mean, that might be a problem. Yeah. So this notion in the United States that we will have ample youth to pay into a fund for the retired is probably uh, no longer valid. There is Europe, Russia, Japan, North America to a degree are areas of youth shortage. China, for example, has a particular problem in that they've had a one-child policy which threatens their social security system. And the social security system in China is the oldest male in the family takes care of the family. So you can imagine you are this only child. You're going to take care of your parents, and you're going to take care of your grandparents. But listen to this. I couldn't find a schematic for this. But imagine this young fellow here is married. All right. Imagine he is married. No boys in the family that he's marrying, so he is carrying not only his parents and grandparents, but his wife's parents and grandparents. How would you like to be that? fellow right there. I don't think so. When individuals, people like this young fellow, feel that they are being threatened, feel that their livelihood is being threatened, often they react in adverse ways. So I think not just overpopulation, but underpopulation in some areas of the world could be a source of conflict. Now, we're going to see if multimedia works. I'm hoping when I hit this green button here that some more music comes, okay? Are we convinced? Yep. We think it's going to happen? Yeah. All right, here we go. All day I face the barren ways without the taste of water. I'm a country and western fan. I apologize for the music. <laughs> that song is actually older than I am, and I'm pretty old. But yeah, water scarcity is a future problem that I don't think we take seriously. And for just a couple minutes, I'd like to uh, explain that to you. Um, now, young fellow, you're pretty smart. So tell me, how many liters of water do we need a day to survive? Give this kid a round of applause, will ya? Give him another round of applause. The audience is going to think this is a setup, I think. All right, sitting right here, answering all the questions. OK, so you're, you're, bat you're batting about 100% now. So how many days can a person live without water? Four weeks. Four weeks? One week. Physiologically, maybe. Generally, we talk in three. So generally, we say you can live three days without water. All right? But you're still doing good. We'll give you a round of applause later. All right? So I'm not going to ask you this question, because you probably know the answer. How many liters of water a day do you use, young lady? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. How many in here are vegetarians? Raise your hand. I can't ask you this question. If you are a vegetarian, this isn't about you, OK? <laughs> Who is not a vegetarian? Raise your hand. All right, sir, how many liters of water a day do you use? A lot. <laughs> give me, an, a, give me a, a, remember, we're talking in threes here. There's method to my madness. How many liters of water do you use a day? 30. How much? 300. Who says 300? Anybody want to raise that a little bit? What if I told you you use 3,000 liters of water a day? How many of you are meat eaters? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. All of the water that goes into the grain, the grass, to feed the animals, raising the animals, drinking water, food processing. If you are a meat eater, you use 3,000 liters of water a day. A day.
a day. There's a double threat here. Remember I talked about population increase? In a globalized economy, as people gain wealth, what do they eat more of? Meat. So in China, for, I've been going to China since 1979. I can tell you when I first started going, if you had a couple of three or four ounces of meat a week, that was pretty good. Now China is becoming one of the largest meat-consuming countries in the world because average annual incomes are increasing, okay? So there's a double whammy with population and water. As incomes increase, people eat more meat, which causes the use of more water. But folks, we're running out of water. Now this is water scarcity today, all right? You notice the United States is in pretty good, uh, pretty good shape. Not true. This is water scarcity in 2025. I am from California. I can guarantee you we have a water problem in California, a severe water problem in California that unfortunately we have not, our politicians and our population hasn't come to grips with yet. Right? So it's coming, and it's going to come here. Africa is at risk. Uh, North Africa is at risk. So there are going to be problems. Global threat. I'll give you a case study, Lake Chad in Africa, four countries depend on Lake Chad for the livelihood, fishing, uh, tourism, uh, farming, and Lake Chad is now a mud puddle compared to what it was in 1963. And if you look at the 2010 map, it's even smaller than 2001. So what are all the people in Chad that used to make a living doing agriculture, tourism, and fishing, what are they doing now for a living? They're trafficking in drugs, weapons, people, antiquities to live. Lack of water is a problem. Boko Haram, you've heard of Boko Haram? It's a terrorist group in Africa, right? Now, if you look at this chart, we say it's a religious problem between Muslims and Christians. That's what you hear, right? I mean, that's what you've heard. Well, that may be part of it. The real problem is that the Muslims in the north are herders, animal herders. They raise cattle, raise goats, raise sheep. Desertification of the Sahara is moving south six kilometers a year. So the herders are being forced south. Christians in southern Nigeria are farmers. The problem in Nigeria across the belt here, as they call it, through the Jos Plateau, is that there's not enough water. So the conflict in Africa that Boko Haram's involved in is more about water use and land use than it is religion. But we don't, we don't reflect on that. Well All right. So both causes, population, both increase and not enough population or young population in some parts of the world, I think, are sources of conflict, as I do, I believe, water is. So what can we do about it? What's next? So all the youth in here, these are your problems that you're going to have to face because my generation didn't face them for you. Sorry. It's true. What can you do? Birth control? I have question marks there because technologically we can control birth. But many cultures, religions of the world do not subscribe to birth control, so it's a challenge. Technologically, birth control is factual. Practically, maybe not. For water, desalinization plants. Saudi Arabia, Israel, both have desalinization uh, industries. California, where I live in Monterey, we're going to bring one online fairly soon, so it's a possibility. But I ask you this, how many, anybody here have a saltwater fish tank? Raise your hand. Yeah, not so much in Boston, I guess. If you had a saltwater fish tank, I took care of a saltwater fish tank once, it was huge. So I house sat for a person. The only thing I had to do was feed the fish in the saltwater fish tank. Three days before this person came back, after me living in his house for three months, his fish started swimming into the side of the tank. And I thought, holy cow, what's going on? So I asked, the reason was the salinization level in the tanks was too high. So with desalinization, eventually, what do you do with all the salt? Now think about it. Salt is, I don't know if toxic's the right word, but salt is... You know, the Romans salted Carthage earth, and they still can't grow stuff there. That was centuries ago. So what are you going to do with all the salt will be a problem. 
That's why I have a question mark there, because someone's going to have to figure that out. Genomics, getting better to yield from crops. Now, a lot of people don't like to talk about sort of altering food, but you can do it. A study at the University of Illinois has used pineapple as example. By altering the DNA just a little bit in a pineapple, they can get the same volume of pineapple production with half the water. Now you say, well, gosh, what does that mean? Pineapples, I mean, a lot of people eat pineapple. Pineapple is actually a grass. So if they can do this DNA with pineapple, think what they can do with wheat, with corn, with other grass-type foods. So technologically, we might have you know, some solutions in uh, genomics. Brown is the new green in California. This is a before and after look, the house. In my little place in Pebble Beach, we're doing that as we speak. We're going from grass to brown as we speak. And it's not because we wanted to, it's because we're being told to. But conservation, always important. OK, I think this is just about the end of my pitch. We talk about water a lot. And years ago, people used to talk about oil shortages, right? There was a graph in 2013, oil was going to go down like this, oil was going to tank, oil was going to be $22 a gallon to fill up your tank. Not true. We're finding more oil everywhere. Oil, interestingly, there are substitutes for oil, right? And we're exploring a lot of ways to substitute for oil for energy and power. Can anybody here tell me what the substitute for water is? Now, I had a person actually in Boston a couple years ago, I gave this pitch, and I said, you know, will anybody tell me what the substitute for water is? And he was sitting right there where you are, young lady, and he said, beer. <laughs> I'm not joking. <laughs> I said, okay, yeah, <laughs> I'll move on now. So yes, water is important, and I think water is a huge potential threat for which we don't have many solutions now, and I challenge the youth in this room to uh, help us through the future. I do all, this is my chaos picture. I don't like chaos, I like structure. I'm an army general, you know, I like structure. I don't like chaos, I like to plan. So I wish I were better at planning the future, being able to address population and water problems, but I'm not. To end, I was going to end here and say thank you, but I have added another slide to show you that present day is the future. The clear and present danger to the United States, I believe, still is ISIS. But I'm going to just go to this slide and have you look at these headlines and to see if ISIS doesn't understand what I'm trying to say today. And I hope this makes my point. Thank you very much. I very much enjoyed talking to you today.